What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kinda Funny Games Daily for Monday, June 19th, 2017. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside the busiest lady in gaming, Andrea Renee. That's me. That's you. How are you, Andrea? I'm actually still real tired from I was going to say, are you hanging in there after E3 2017? Yeah, so my voice is still on its way back. Sure. So I'm sorry if I'm a little croaky today. No, it happens. Um, but it was a very long, very exciting, eventful week. Did um, you have a good one? Did you enjoy E3 2017? Yeah, it was, it was so crazy because I was in so many different places uh, throughout the it's week, easily. but... It was um it was really fun. I didn't get to see and play as many games as I would have sure. liked, um, but I got to talk to a lot of great people, and uh, you know a lot of people came up to the Facebook booth and right. said hello, which was really nice. Well, that's always the downside of what and this is I know what was me tiniest violin. The downside of what we do is the fact that when I when we did Gamespot is kind of funny the entire time like two years ago, and then when I used to do IGN's live show hosting, right? Like you only see what comes to you. Yeah, so, exactly. Like, it was this year, you know, we did the afternoon of Gamespot, even though we got in a day late, and then we're able to run around and see different things but even then it was like uh, over on the forums kids were asking me like have you, did you is there an update on cuphead i'm like i did not get to see cuphead well, we I, got a release date i'm ready for <laughs> cuphead i'm glad there's finally a release date but no we didn't we didn't bust over there to see that one do that right exactly uh thank you for joining me this is the first ever episode of kind of funny games daily i'm so pumped i know me too I'm very we've been excited. talking about doing something for a really long time so i'm glad we're finally making it happen yep uh ladies and gentlemen if you for some reason don't know here's what kind of funny games daily is it is the dna of podcast beyond of ps i love you xoxo it is a daily show about video game news going through it talking it out seeing what's happening giving some context to it then answering questions having fun bits doing all different kinds of segments and stuff like that uh there are a whole bunch of things in process right now as we move i got a text message i want to see if this is from james no this is jen's uber that didn't help me at all uh basically if you Go to my Twitter right now. There is a link up to go ask questions for this. The idea is that I'll gather everything in the morning, have a real produced show, basically a produced PS I love you XOXO every day, but you're using a Google form now to submit in for what your question is. Uh, I have a couple different bits. However, I do need your help live because here's the thing. We're doing the show and it's confusing as hell I know. We're doing the show live on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games, but you're just windowing. You're getting to watch us record it. There's no, there's no subs. There's none of this stuff. There's no chat for us to look at. That's not what this show is. This show is, hey, let's have the discussion we're going to have and keep it going uh then it goes up on youtube.com slash kind of funny games it goes up on podcast services we are up on itunes now i need you all to go subscribe even if you're not going to use the itunes feed go subscribe to it rate the podcast it helps us out a lot if you're on another podcast service they are filtering out their their tendrils getting into the googles and the whatnots and stuff like that However, if you are watching live, the way we have you interact is simple over on kind of funny.com slash forums there is Kind of funny games daily, colon, you're wrong. Uh, I want you guys to be the stat boy for this show, like PTI. Basically, when we start talking, we're going to screw something up. We're going to say somebody did something when they didn't or not. Most be, certainly. Be, you go in there, you post it. I need the facts. Get right to the point of the facts. Don't sit around. Don't waste. Don't, don't tell me a novel there. I just need to know what we screwed up and we'll read it at the end. Make sure you check if anybody else posted it and we'll go from there. And that'll be hopefully a segment. But again, this show, who the hell knows what's going to happen? We're going to figure out as we go. That's the whole point of Kind of Funny. Doing yeah. Doing it on the fly. Figuring it all out. You know what I mean? By the seat of our pants. All right. Or our dress. Whichever it may be. <laughs> Let's jump in with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. <laughs> Time for some news. <laughs> that is, I asked Kevin for one contribution to this show, and that was it. And he just knocked it out of the park. Good job, Kev. Good job, Kev. Uh, so the idea of the Roper Report here on Kind of Funny Games Daily isn't, hey, here's everything you missed. Here's the biggest stuff that you might have missed. Now, starting a show that's, hey, we want to talk about the daily news. The day after E3, bad idea. Yeah. A lot of news. Generally not a lot of news the Monday well, after E3. there's so E3. much news from E3, that then how, and then, but then there's nothing happening in the current space, so we just have to go. In. But there's a lot of things to update you on. I thought the one that was the most interesting, Andrea Renee, was this whole no cross-play for PlayStation. It was a very hot topic last year, or right. last week, excuse me. Well, it's been, that's the thing is it's been going since last year, right? Last year, they talked about this. Sony said, quote, we would be happy to have the conversation with any publishers or developers who are interested in cross-platform play. Right, because it kind of kicked off with Rocket League when they announced, you know, cross-platform play. Yeah. And then, you know, Phil Spencer talked about how Xbox and PC are capable uh, of doing cross-play with PlayStation, but 
it's PlayStation who are saying, you know, no, we're not interested. Right. And there had been this thing. So Sony gives this, you know, lip service response last year. Then this year, after having the cross play with <sighs> the PC version of uh, so Rocket League, this, this year, year, Minecraft comes out and Xbox or at the Xbox conference and Xbox is like, this is now you play it across all con- the switch, the 360, the the mobile, the Xbox one, the Xbox one X, all, all these different things. People are like, oh, PlayStation. They're like, no, not PlayStation. PlayStation said no. And they're like, oh. Then Rocket League comes out with their Switch thing, and they're like, play across all platforms. Play everybody. And people are like, PlayStation? And they're like, no. <laughs> Just this Switch, PC, mobile, Xbox thing. Right. Everybody goes, what the hell does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. Why is that happening? Boo, boo, boo. Then Jim Ryan tells Eurogamer, right? Quote, we have a contract with the people who go online with us, that we look after them, and they are within the PlayStation curated universe, exposing what in many cases are children to external influences we have no ability to manage or look after. It's something we have to think about very carefully. This is a face palm kind of moment, Why? right? Like, I mean, I'm sure the PR people off stage when he was doing that interview were like, oh, I did you say that? I mean, and, and, you know, Phil Spencer gave a response. He told Polygon the fact that somebody would kind of make an assertion that somehow we're not keeping Minecraft players safe. I found not only from a Minecraft or excuse me, a Microsoft perspective, but from a game industry perspective. Like, I don't know why that has to become the dialogue that doesn't seem healthy for anyone. He's absolutely right. There was no reason why Jim Ryan should have said what he said about them not keeping their community safe. I mean, Nintendo of all people it's Nintendo. has you been can't keeping children safe in their communities for much longer than anybody else has. So, it's a completely tone yeah. deaf bonehead response that I can't understand how PlayStation didn't have an answer for. Even if you don't know, well, you must have known because I'm sure Rocket League and Minecraft at some point ask you. Someone on in the PlayStation team understands that this is going to happen at some point. We need a response. We need an answer. And again, them being a privately held business or whatever, being a business, I should say, it doesn't, okay, I think there's nothing wrong with coming out and being like, we think the 70 some PlayStation 4 users out there is enough of a user base for it. We don't need to get into the Xbox. We don't need to get in the Switch. Instead to grasp at straws and blame kids, it's like, what, what? Yeah, it's a frustrating uh, topic, I think, not only for the executives who are having to deal with the, the fallout from the response, but also for the community. I I think we all would have, appreciate just a little bit of transparency mm-hmm. from PlayStation if, if they would just come forward and say hey for business reasons we there will not be cross play with Xbox One it, you know like I just want them to like like put the nail in the coffin and like let it be done because I don't think it's ever going to happen and they're kind of leaving the door open in this really ambiguous way that makes it really difficult for players uh, um, to want to like be on their side about it but like yeah. they don't have to do cross play I mean they have probably, you know, double the install base of the Xbox One at this point. And if they just came forward and say, hey, like for business reasons, we just are not going to do crossplay and just like put it to bed, I think that would be the best call. But I don't know why they're continuing. Well, you know, it gets more interesting, it right? Because I had seen all that when we're at E3, but information's coming from every direction. GameSpot that had this one up there, right? However, to play Switch, you have to make an Xbox Live account. Quote, it's an Xbox Live account. That's our gaming social network, uh, Phil Spencer said on Giant Bomb. Uh, We use Xbox Live as the way to make sure we know who our players are. Controls controls around parental controls and other things that we put in the platforms are there. And as you're buying things in Minecraft, you want to make sure you have them available on all the other platforms. So we have to know who you are. If you have if you have a realm that you've created on the PC and you want to get into on the Switch, you have an identity system and we just use Xbox Live. Right there, that makes so much more sense mm-hmm. and I, if I was Jim Ryan I would have been like uh, you know we thought about it but the fact that you need to make our competitors online account through what would have been the PlayStation interface right the fact that a PlayStation is going to say Xbox I understand the sticky situation but and it might not be gamer friendly to say we won't work that way but it isn't all sunshine and roses right it is the fact that there is a competition still going here and as much yeah. as Xbox I saw another article where Xbox was like oh like the the us versus them competition it's just it's bad for gaming right and it's like well yeah when you're losing I'm sure it is you don't want to that's not a great thing to have yeah I, I mean th- he was kind of put into a corner he had to kind of say something like that and I'm sure that they're frustrated that they're going for this message of unification across all of the Minecraft platforms and as you know one of the biggest games of all time yeah. it does make sense that in their minds you know if they could just add that one last platform, then everything would be, you know, peachy. But I think they just need to let it go. I think, you know, 
Phil Spencer and his team are doing great things with the Minecraft IP, but like they really just need to like let the Xbox One and PS4 crossplay like just die. let it go. But let it, it, looks it, die. So, it looks so good for them and so bad for PlayStation. I understand why they'll keep bringing it up. Oh, and keep course. talking about it. of course. But I think PlayStation is in the position of like Coca Cola looking at Pepsi going sure. like, why do we need to play nice together? Like, I don't even need to acknowledge that you exist. Exactly. Exactly. Don't acknowledge they exist. <laughs> I was trying to think of who the analog to us was in a, in a, in a way to, it'd be like us acknowledging IGN. We don't need them. They're dead to us, you know what I mean? But, exactly. then, but I thought easy allies and I'm like, no, Brandon was just on the show. I like him a lot. He's I'm a very nice. Gentleman. But those IGN people, Fran Mirabella, <laughs> <laughs> not a fan of that. Not a fan of that one bit. Uh, the next story I want to bring up is another one that popped after E3, so it kind of got buried in everything. IO Interactive is independent, and they have Hitman. Uh, of course, ladies and gentlemen, back in May, Square Enix dropped IO Interactive, quote, to maximize player satisfaction as well as market potential going forward, we are focusing our resources and energies on key franchises and studios, Square Enix said in its statement. As a result, the company has regrettably decided to withdraw from the business of IO Interactive, a wholly owned subsidiary of, Dan of a Danish corporation as of March 31st, 2017. This happened... Total confusion then as to what that meant. Who had, does Square have the Hitman franchise? Did they? Does IO have it? IO then had some layoffs. They had a giant public statement of thank you, we're gonna sort all this out. Laid some people off, said it was what they had to do for business, and then it was quiet on the Western Front to figure out what was going on. Right. Then, uh, over the weekend, they the studio CEO posted a giant letter that was very nice and said, therefore I am proud to announce today that IO Interactive is now officially an independent studio. We have successfully colluded, uh, concluded, not colluded. <laughs> Collusion! Collu <laughs> concluded our negotiations with Square Enix and have agreed to a management buyout. Crucially, we will keep all the rights to the Hitman IP. This is a watershed moment for IO Interactive. As of today, we have complete control over the direction for our studio and the Hitman IP. We're about to forge our own future, and it's incredibly exciting. We are now open to opportunities with future collaborators and partners to help strengthen us as a studio and ensure that we can produce the best games possible for our community. So a happy ending there yeah i think it's great I, i'm a little confused as to why they didn't work out all these details before they announced that square was getting rid of io yeah i think it would have made a much better um you know message if they had worked out the details of io retaining the ip of hitman and then said hey you know they're gonna go their own way they're taking hitman with them yeah because i remember when this news came out it was so shocking because hitman was such a well done game Beloved. this last time around you know Critics like players, the yeah. season pass came out they released all the content on disc it seemed like everyone really enjoyed this new iteration of the game um and so i think it left a lot of us kind of like scratching our heads going like why did square enix decide to do this and for me, it was, I thought that was the canary in the coal mine, that this came together quick. Mm -hmm. Something happened here. I don't know wh where it's coming down. I mean, Square is Japan. So something from the J Japanese side is coming down of like, kill this, do that. We're making all these changes to make sure our profits look better on a spreadsheet or whatever. But it sounded, yeah, like, well, why wouldn't you? Why, why wouldn't there be, again, answers as soon as this happens? You know the first thing people are going to ask is, where's Hitman? What's going on? But then again, I don't know if, you know, in that situation, Square wants to help support IO and pr promote the fact that maybe they're going to have it or if they necessarily care, right? Well, I think the frustrating part is when you think about the giant global structure of a conglomerate like Square Enix. Yeah. The people who are making those financial decisions aren't thinking about the gamer. They're not oh, thinking course, about the studio members, probably. They're thinking about like you said, a number on a spreadsheet. What's going to look best for our, our shareholders, right? That's going to look best on our balance sheet. And I think if the people in the communications department maybe had a little bit more to do with the announcement, um, they could have influenced it and maybe, you know, we would have seen Massage it come together it. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit better, but I mean, such is the way of business and video games. What's fascinating now for me is the fact that I think their next game is going to be so much bigger than this one. You know, because it was that thing that you think that they're going to have the funding to do that. I do because well, I think now it's the whole and now it's the game of expectations, right. right? It's what we always talk about, especially when I talk uh, when I give all my Patreon talks or whatever. And I talk about us, but now what I was talking about with Danny, right? Where Danny worked at Gamespot, he makes these awesome documentaries, and they do no traffic. Because people aren't thinking GameSpot and that. But when he goes off and does no, cl no clip on his own, here's a whole bunch of money and they do runaway views, right? It's that balance of expectation of knowing what you're getting. And I think now that they have such a great narrative behind them, now that they have the idea that when Hitman originally got announced as, okay, cool, it's episodic, we were all like, what What the fuck does that mean? How is that going <laughs> to work out? What is it going to be? Now people understand that. It's what I was talking about similar to Uncharted, Uncharted 2. By the time, when Uncharted 1 hits, not as many people have PS3s. So they're like, 
okay, whatever. The people who get it, get it and like it. But then when Uncharted 2 finally came around, enough people had bought PS3s that they were like, oh, I've heard of Uncharted. I know that that was interesting. I think now that you have this wave of goodwill, hey, we're IO Interactive, we own our destiny, we're making another Hitman game, you're going to have people come out and go, I understand now that number, the first Hitman was good and people really liked it. I understand that these guys are bootstrap people pulling themselves up, no man holding them down. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's like something that, that goes a long way with gamers, it seems. I... I I kind of agree with you. Um, I think that it is going to give them the freedom, the not only from a creative standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, to decide how they want to spend their dollars. If they would rather spend more on production, adding more features to the game, or spend more on, on buying ad space. It, it gives them the flexibility to make the kinds of strategic business deals that they probably didn't have because Square made sure. those decisions for them. Yeah. I think getting out from underneath that and then being able to have a team you want, I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised if there was more, even more time between between episodes next time around, right? Like here's episode one of Hitman, whatever they're gonna call it, season two, year two. And we're gonna put it out and really listen to your feedback and really hone in on what episode two will be then. That would be interesting. I don't know if that's how video game production works, well, but- Telltale does it, huh? <laughs> don't they? Um, Finish your games faster. <laughs> maybe, no, I don't know. <laughs> next story I got for you. E3 was open to the public this year. Shocker, I know you didn't notice probably. I didn't notice at all. I guess I totally noticed. Uh, no, the ESA put out a whole bunch of information on it, right? So we already knew that it was 15,000 consumers getting to come this year. Uh, total attendance for E3 this year was 68,400, which is up about 19,000 from what it was in That's 2016. That's a lot of people. That's a ton of people. And so what I want to know is what was your experience? This is one of the, I, we put out the questions, you know, like what are people uh, wanting us to talk about? You know, it's a daily news show. What is the big story for Monday? And the one was, well, how was E3 for you guys, especially with all these people there? Um, it definitely was crowded and it was crowded in a really frustrating way. If you think about a show like PAX East, they had an uh, estimated attendance of 75,000 attendees this year. Yeah. So more people than what E3 had. But Read Pop, the company that runs the PAX conventions, is prepared for that amount of people. Yeah. They have what's a room called a Q hall where you line up to get inside the expo floor. E3 didn't have that on Tuesday. There was a line around the block of the convention center because there was just no place to put all of these people who were queuing up to get inside. They also had like three different doors that you could go in at PAX. There's like one central door. You know what to do, where Everybody to has to go through metal detectors. There's security. There was none of that at the convention center, at least that I saw. Yeah. I never had to go through a metal detector once. No, just getting inside go through and show my center. badge to that one person. With um, the little pen light, he doesn't want to be there. So, like, not only was security a big issue, and there were some specific incidences we can talk about later if you want, but um, once you were on the show floor, like, the lines inside each of the booths were really confusing. You didn't know where to go, where to line up for which station. And, you know, some of the games that would have been really easy for people like us to, like, walk up to and get hands on within a few minutes sure. were hours wait. And it was like having a media badge didn't give you the kind of access that it has previously. I've always said that E3 is an appointment-based show. No matter how level, how high you are up on the media food chain, you still have to make appointments to see the bulk of everything at E3. Um, but this year was particularly challenging. Sure. So you were there on Tuesday, and I know that the cops came by and said you had like uh, there was an announcement made, right? That all right, 15 minutes early, we're opening the doors. Yeah, there was a fire code hazard. So they oh, for the first time ever, they opened the doors to the expo um, and let people kind of rush in early. And normally, if you remember pr years past. Tuesday is usually a pretty easy day getting in with your badge. They like scan it with a black light. Yeah. But then by Wednesday and Thursday, they make you show your driver's license every time you enter the hall, mm -hmm. which is super frustrating. And also like, it's so predictable. Tuesday is always never a problem. And then by Wednesday, Thursday, like counterfeit badges start showing up. Yeah, and yeah. so now you have to bring your ID. They could not check people's IDs this year because there was just too many people. Yeah. And the Los Angeles Convention Center just was not equipped to deal with the long lines that it would create to like have everybody pull their ID To out. do it the right way. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it was, um, it was, uh, I think a big learning experience for the ESA, yeah. um, to say, Hey, we did a lot of things wrong, but the upside was all of those extra people really made for a more invigorating, electrifying kind of atmosphere. Sure. Um, I talked to a bunch of devs who have shown at E3 for many years and they said that having the consumers there really kind of invigorated the people at the booth because some of these smaller games that would be pretty empty you know, at certain times of the week in previous years were packed. Yeah. Every booth had people in it all the time. And I think that really helped um, motivate the devs who were in those booths because how sad is it to like 
put all of this work into bringing a demo to E3. And all the money it costs for that booth. Right, and having to kind of beg people or beg exactly. press to come see it. They IGN didn't have to have do that this year. It. They can't swing by. We're yeah, too small staff exactly. to see everything. Yeah, so you I think terrible. that that was really exciting. I think, you know, E3, people in our industry have a history of getting kind of curmudgeon about it and really kind of looking down on it. And that's frustrating for people like us who get really excited about yeah. shows like this. And I think having the public there really installed that like enthusiasm and really brought it back in a great way. I mean, there were certainly problems, but I think the benefits outweighed the issues. Sure. That was my thing, you know, leading into E3, I've talked about it a lot on the games cast and the morning show that once was. Um, and the fact was I was so concerned that, people wouldn't be happy with what they were spending it on, right? Because it was $150 for early bird tickets, $250 for regular. Very expensive ticket. And I kept telling everybody, or trying to, at least our audience, the fact that this isn't going to be a show aimed at you. This is not PlayStation trying to impress the consumer. This is PlayStation trying to make media appointments and do all these different things. And it's not packs where they're going to have all these awesome, fun things for you to do, I thought, probably. And it seemed like that was the thing. People were either waiting in line, all this different stuff was happening. What I found interesting about it was... On the show, well, I got we so we skipped Tuesday because of our schedule, right? We did the morning, the Nintendo reactions here, flew down and then worked on Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday, I didn't have a problem getting around or in. I felt like it was the doors opened, everybody ran, and they got into lines for five hours. And so everybody was just plastered to walls for the most part. Or, you know, if we were doing uh, like the live show, they came over and watched the live show. But it wasn't to the point where I felt like I couldn't move. But I know Tuesday was different. Everybody was saying Tuesday was different. That area behind Nintendo wasn't used uh, as a lineup place before or something. And like there was the Nintendo booth itself, I guess, had people no system for you to go play anything. So people were just wandering up on Tuesday and like overnight they recrafted their booth and did all these different things I heard make it manageable to make it but it was the fact that i think a consumer was coming in expecting a pax and a publisher was coming in expecting it to be e3 as usual not something different there you go yeah so the stats i want to toss out uh i put up a poll on my and this is totally unscientific put up a poll on my twitter right got about 3900 votes 21 percent said yes it was worth it that they went to e3 and yes it was worth it 79 percent said no they went there and it wasn't worth it uh that of course all haphazard polling anybody could lie maybe didn't even go to e3 They're just voting to vote however over at disconnected gamer andrew who used to work at radio no not radio playstation no it was radio playstation right he worked over there now he does disconnected gamer he put up a whole thing uh, that i read you should go check out uh it's the dgcast.com if you want to go read the entire thing but uh pull out here is i felt on wanted at the show it's not that personally someone said get out of here but booth staff and exhibitors definitely look looked you up and down if you had the bright yellow slash green badge holder friends of mine in the industry felt burdened with the extra attendees and the clog dials full of people wandering aimlessly a handful of industry booth workers gave zero attention when trying to talk about their games and products some looked at the badge and kept doing what they were doing my personal hot take on E3 becoming a consumer show, it's stupid. Don't do this again. It seems like they're just doing it for the money, and that's disappointing because it shows a lack of concern for everyone who's trying to attend and have a good time. Now, the counterbalance to this is that every time somebody would stop me for a photo and they were waiting in line, I talk, I, outside, this guy had been waiting four and a half hours to play Wolfenstein. And I was like, good on you, man. And I was like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And I ask PAX people this all the time, too. Is it worth it? Are you having a good time? And most of the people I asked at E3 gave me one of these where I was like, yeah, yeah. Like they, there was a moment of thought. Whereas it packs people. I was like, oh my God, it's phenomenal. Of course. I don't mind waiting forever to play this Devolver game. But is some of that them having to justify to themselves as Upsell they're themselves. waiting in yeah. a line? Because how could you say, no, it's not worth it while you're standing there in that line? Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's a big part of it, right? Of trying to tell yourself that this is good. And I don't know, like, because I always talk about it very openly, right? Of like... I love going to PAXs and I love going to the panels and doing the panels and all. And I love seeing games there too. But if I was a consumer, I would never go wait in line four hours to play a 15 minute demo. Like that just, that math doesn't equate out for something that's going to be out for, you know, later this year or something to that effect. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, um, it's all about justifying it to yourself and saying, is my time worth, you know, what I'm spending it on? Yeah. Um, I think that some of the lines were unnecessarily long, which is kind of frustrating. I think some of the demos were unnecessarily long. Um, I went to a media showcase on Monday night for Ubisoft yeah. and I got to play some games. And of course, as a giant Assassin's Creed fan, I was like, can I please get hands on with Origins? The first appointment they had available was 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, that's too late. I, like, can't. I got a live show to sleep for. <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that. Um, and it was because it was a 50 minute 
minute demo, Jeez. five zero. Yeah. That's too long. That's yeah. too long of a, of a demo. I, I mean, it's great for press who have the time to sit down and are doing a lengthy preview. Yeah. But to have something like that um, on, on the show floor, I think the one that Ubisoft had in their booth was 15 minutes. Yeah, they had two not, parts. Not 50. I went and did, um, did one mission, then it was Gladiator Arena. Yeah. yeah. I, I just think that it's something that, you know, devs need to be mindful of when they're showing it to, you know, general consumers versus people who are going to be writing up uh, coverage about it. Um, and I didn't get enough hands on time with booths on the show floor to know kind of what the general, um, you know, averages were for um, length of demos across well, all the different publishers. Bethesda but that was the one I was worried about because when I first, the first time I played Wolfenstein was at PAX, you know, years ago, obviously. And I remember sitting down, I'm like, all right, cool. How long's the demo? And I put them on, they went an hour and a half. And I went, what? Nope. No? Sorry, no. Hey, nope. How long is this one supposed to be? <laughs> Like, yeah, you're playing through the whole opening of the game, and the opening of the game is not that great, but it was still like, oh, man, this is, I, that's weird that I think I have other things to do, but like their Wolfenstein demo this time was 20 minutes 30 if you were struggling, and then yeah. got to run through all this other stuff, but it was good. I was, you know, when, when you share this story with me, it really kind of made me sad that this uh, person had a really, you know, bad experience at their first E3, and yeah. I really hope that it doesn't kind of, you know, tarnish the way they think about E3, they don't think about, you know, the, the industry as a whole, because, you know, I asked on Twitter for some people to tell me about their E3 consumer experiences and all of the experiences for that people wrote to me about were positive. One, for example, from, you know, uh, Matt Miller says, just getting to be around industry professionals and play some of the best and brightest up and coming games was a dream come true. And I feel like that's what a lot of people felt. 100%. But like your poll kind of got me down a little bit. <laughs> I, but again, like it's a Twitter poll. You know what yeah. I mean? Like uh, the people there seemed happy. They seemed like they were enjoying it. I think uh, Cole Walker wrote in just like you can at kindoffunny.com slash KFDC. That might not be working yet. <laughs> Is that right? Either Kevin's DC Daily his Cast. Head. Kind of funny. No, it's kind of funny games daily. So KF G G G G D. Don't, don't bother putting that in the corrections. We know we screwed up. Uh, <laughs> that link might not be working, but by the time this gets on YouTube and iTunes, where I'm sure you've rated and subscribed, right? Please help us out. It will be. Uh, anyways, Cole Walker said, what do you think they could do to improve it for next year if they allow the public again? I think first off, they're going to allow the public again. I mean, it was a lot of money. You I mean you do the math, 15,000 times 150 or yeah. whatever. You Back know? to Andrew's point where he's like, you know, it seems like it was just for the money or whatever. It was 100%. They opened the doors for, they're trying to figure out how to make E3 be relevant, survive in a place where it, it its importance has winged a bit, I guess. But it's more because like, there's a Destiny event and there's PSX and there's this and it's not to mention all the other trade shows they've competed against. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing they need to do is completely reevaluate um, their security system and reevaluate, you know, how they are going to queue people, not only to get into the expo hall, but to queue people inside the booths as well. And sure. hopefully they take, key, uh, you know, like cues from people like PAX or even like Comic-Con. I would love to see either a wristband system for lines. Um, I just spent two days at Disney, like the fast fast system that they have there would be obviously really difficult to implement probably, but something like that. That's my thing is and as somebody who's never had to run a booth. So I'm talking out of my ass as I often do on these shows. I felt like when people, I'm like, oh, I've been waiting in line four hours and I'm like, how hard would it be for someone with a clipboard to come through and like, we have 20 slots every time and maybe we only give away 15, but come back here at one o'clock with this ticket and we let you in the thing. You know right. what I mean? I mean, it just seems like a, an absolute waste of people's time to only get to see two or three games when they could be using that wait time to go see maybe some of the smaller games that don't yeah. get enough attention. To so see, you know, like the Into the Pixel art exhibit or to go visit the Devolver lot or, sure. you know, or, or see any of the other, you know, many things that are out at the show. But I think they need to do that to make it better. And I think publishers maybe need to start looking at it as a consumer facing show yeah. more than they did this year. Probably. Um, I think that yeah. some, some kind of the management you're talking about, I don't, I'm not, I don't, people are all up in arms about this. I think public days would be a good idea. Like, like a Gamescom model. Yeah. I think it, I think mm -hmm. doing three days of media only in quotes and then a public day where it's also media. If you need to float around and see stuff would be fine. Cause then it would just be like how it is now where it's like, you know, all the appointments I had with PlayStation were off in the PlayStation behind closed doors rooms or whatever. So it wasn't like I was competing with uh, green or yellow badge holders to get there. There seems there's got to be a balance somewhere in this. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, going to a, a TGS or Gamescom model of having business days and then having a public days would be the right uh, transition. But there are still people out there that think E3 is going to go away. Uh, there, I, Not with the even money they last, made this year. Even last week, people were like, E3 needs to change, it needs to die, it needs to go away. And I was like, are you crazy? It's not going away. Yeah. 
Yeah, EA can try as much as they want with these EA plays and stuff. And <laughs> it's still gonna be. They're still gonna be. They're still gonna be an E3. Don't worry yeah. about that. And then the final one on the Roper Report today is a short one. AtariBox.com. Have you seen all this? I have. I saw the slick trailer. The wood grain is back. It, so if you haven't seen it, Atari's been teasing that they're cutting back into the hardware market. They have AtariBox.com. You can go check it out. They have a little teaser trailer on there right now that, yeah, is slowly going over, very zoomed up like you'd expect a PlayStation or an Xbox reveal, showing the wood paneling, showing a little bit of ports and stuff like that. And then over on Games Beat, the Atari CEO said, quote, we're back in the hardware business. He then declined to describe a lot of the details about the console, but he said it is based on PC technology. He said it's Atari is still working on the design and will reveal it at a later date. This has got to be like an NES Mini, right? That's what this thing's got to be. I mean, that is the only logical explanation why they would want to create new hardware to try to compete with the hardware that's already out there. I mean, they said it was going to be, you know, it sounds like it'll be kind of like a Steam box in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, I just... Why? It's got to be an NES Mini. It can't be anything other than that. And I know that kind of exists in that bootleg fashion. Yeah. When you all go through the mall food court and there's like the hollowed out NES or uh, N64 that has that controller but also yeah. runs Atari As games. long as they're not going to try to be Ouya, I think we'll be okay. No one will ever try to be Ouya <laughs> again. Uh, oh, wait, that, but before you conclude, sure? did, did you want to talk about this? No, I'm tossing it in the next segment, see. Oh, you didn't want to talk about this? No, because I'm putting it, it's right there. Oh, okay. See, no, it's, it, you're smart. You're, you're, cause in, in traditional old DNA, PSI Love You Beyond, that would have been a news story in the Roper Report. But after the Roper Report, we move into the official lifts of upcoming software across each and every platform as listed by the kind of funny games daily hosts each and every day. Kevin, do another <laughs> jingle for me. Anything you want. Just. Ba -da -ba -ba -da. That was really good. That was really good. <laughs> nice so job, the Kevin. idea here is we're a daily show now. <laughs> So if we, we can tell you about what games are coming out each and every day, right? So out today, I, I did nothing. There's, it's not Tuesday. I'm sure Steam put out a million things. I, I'm still, I have to learn the ropes on how to use Steam. But I also like using this for new dates. And so, I, again, E3 just happened a million things. I think th things that might have slipped through the cracks at E3 that I wanted to point out, Super Hot PlayStation 4 and PlayStation VR is coming in, quote, unquote, a few weeks. So sometime this summer we'll be getting that, which is great. Awesome game. Did you ever play it? No. This is your chance. Okay. Kevin, are you excited? Hell yeah. <laughs> and then also, uh, this is from a GameSpot interview. A lot of, you know, scuttlebutt over there about like, well, Detroit become human. Their demo ends, their trailer ends, all that stuff. No release date, no window, nothing like that. David Cage is said on the GameSpot stage that it is 2018. He is hitting 2018. Do I believe him? Not as far as I can throw this entire table. <laughs> I wish him well. I hope he's trying for it, but... I don't think you can take that one to the bank. And then, yes, today, right before we went live, you pointed this one out to me. Final Fantasy 15 episode prompto coming out June 27th. What did you think of the trailer? Um, I think it looks really robust. Um, <laughs> That's one way of putting it. So there's a lot going on in that trailer. Uh, my friend uh, Alex Wright called it. What's good uh, games? Yes, she called it Metal Gear prompto. <laughs> that's what it looks like is hundred percent like the description polygon had up was the gunslinger uh, looking for the truth of his origin in a frigid arctic setting <laughs> and yeah you run around there's all the shooting there's robots there's there's a mech that looks like metal gear i was like damn and he's doing some raid moves yeah okay why not I sign mean, me up yeah i mean it, i think this is when you talk about dlc that's worth the price tag this is something that you know fans are looking for I sure mean, it's part of the season pass which is six episodes that you can get for 24.99 uh, plus an all new gameplay mode so i mean for 25 bucks you want some you know substantial some meat. meaty yeah. yeah yeah exactly did you play final fantasy 15 um about four hours yeah, of me it too, right. <laughs> i don't even i did four hours of i it. watched john play quite a bit okay. he 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 played all the way to the end so yeah yeah i was i you know i thought I was, they, they made such a big deal when we were doing all the coverage with them or the the you know final fantasy uncovered event of like well no it's the game aimed at tim and you greg i was like oh, all right cool and i sat down I'm like why are these guys in leather what is going on you know i can't i just you know i don't want to feed this cat anything i got things to do i gotta move on now in the official list we talk about the release dates right yes kenny smith wrote in the kind of funny dot com slash K F G D nailed it just like you can to be part of the show. Kevin sticking the wide. It creeps me out when I look to the wide and then I'm over there. Yeah, that's the one you stick with for a little bit. All right. Don't you're getting too fit. Oh, Kevin. Uh, Kenny Smith wrote in and said Wolfenstein 2, Assassin's Creed Origins and Mario Odyssey all come out on October 27th. Should one of those games move dates? And if so, which one? 
I don't think any of them need to move dates, but if you had to pick one that's going to probably move, it's Assassin's Creed would be my guess. You think so? I mean, they have historically shuffled their release dates around mm, a little bit. Okay. Um, I think Wolfenstein looks like it's probably going to hit their date, no problem. I feel like they're all so stubborn is that no one will move. Well, I mean, Nintendo doesn't really have a history of announcing a date and then moving it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they have moved games when they have a window we announced. Have a window, yeah, yeah. But, um, like the Wii U's launch window. Well, I mean, went even on look at Zelda, right? A year and a half later. Um, but, um, I don't think any of them need to move. They're all very different kinds of games. That's the thing is, I think they're all, they're all going for an audience. They all have their own niche that they're going for, right? Like Wolfenstein 2 is going to be fine. Especially, again, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a similar situation as I was talking earlier of like, even if you didn't play Wolfenstein, the new order, enough people have talked about that now over the years where you're like, that sounded really good. And the demo was super impressive for Wolfenstein 2. I mean, 2. you should go back and play Wolfenstein. It was excellent. I didn't finish it. And I'll have you know, I am going back to play you it. You should. I am. Yeah, You'll yeah. enjoy it. Except for this weekend, double XP and Friday the 13th. <laughs> Doggies, I can't wait. Are you kidding me right now? Free cons cons uh, counselor packs. I'm getting, I'm getting some free CP in there too, so I can go buy this. It's oh, a yeah. good time to be a Friday the 13th fan, I'll tell you what. Of okay. The game. Just letting you know. Are you into it yet? It no, could be not your yet. New Paragon. No. Drop Paragon, come play Friday the 13th. So, me and the girls are thinking about, about streaming it, but we waited because, you know, they had a few kinks yeah. at launch. And That's so, why they're giving you all this free stuff. I know. <laughs> it's, sorry, guys. Here's some free stuff. Um, but no, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it because it looks fun. Because um, okay. um, I watched uh, you guys play with Sessler and yeah. it looked really fun. If you end up doing that thing, let me come. Okay. Because I will just clown you all out oh my god you'll <laughs> well then never maybe see i coming. won't let you no come. all right well apologies <laughs> yeah i think wolfenstein 2 is gonna be fine assassin's creed is assassin's creed i always talk about being one of the first mainstream games that i knew was really making a, a, an impact when my friend back in chicago was like oh, i never miss one i'm like you barely play games period but you never miss an assassin's creed he's like no i buy everyone and play them right away i'm like damn okay yeah and then mario's mario mario yeah. everybody who has a switch is gonna buy mario so you don't have to worry yeah i think they're all in unique enough situations where i have to sew at it exactly okay uh, let's check in with the listeners. Kevin, I hate you. Hey, listeners. Uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, the new format is simple. You can be part of the show each and every day. You just have to go to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. There you go. Hey, we'll, I'll start thinking <laughs> goddamn, kind of funny, goddamn. That'll get it. But I'm also saying it with like, hope that is working by the time at least the YouTube video goes live, but we'll see. Who thought it would be this hard to make URLs? But apparently Nick's over there. Not doing his job. So let's start with Jackson Giles. He writes in and says, what's a game you expected to debut at the C3, but was a no show? Andrea Renee. Oh man, to debut. Um, Cause the game I wanted to, to arrive came beyond good and evil too. We got to see it. The trailer came uh, and then, Hey, help us build it. And then there was Wait, like a, what? You've a been tech working demo. On this for yeah. like a decade. Where's this game? <laughs> well, I think the game, I don't even know if it's a specific name, but I think we expected to see something from sucker punch 100%. And, we, and we didn't. That's my one man. I cannot yeah. believe we didn't. And I think, and I guess looking back now at the Sony press conference, it makes enough sense. in the fact that they're still, they, it, fe it felt like, Last E3, they had started setting up the dominoes, and you finally started seeing a topple with Uncharted 4, Horizon. You saw where it was all going to go, right, with this first-party exclusivity stuff. And then I think they announced so many, right, where, I mean, like, a, a exclusive, like, Detroit, but then what, you know, Ben was working on. Uh, here's Insom Insomniac with Spider-Man. Again, second party, but exclusive. Um, the idea that, okay, cool, these are all going to be coming in the next year and a half so what is beyond that and it was interesting this year to see them dial that back and not do that not show any more death stranding not do anything with sucker punch but i thought it was a shoe in because no pun intended shuhei yoshida had come on the show the our GameSpot show i think the first year we did it so 2015 and me and colin were like so what's going on with sucker punch he's like oh i've played the game and we're like, what? Uh, like, you know, this place. And then he was on the show this year again. And I was like, so what is going on with Sucker Punch? You told us he played. He's like, oh, I've played it a lot more since then. I'm like, God, what is it? What are you doing? But I mean, they don't need to put it out, right? They don't need to. I think you see it not burning them. But this was a year where the press conference ended and there was a malaise to it of like, I, what I kept saying is, I think the last few Sony press conferences have been grand slams. They're just knocking it out of the park. Mm -hmm. And then this year was a home run. And a home run's fine, but you just did all these grand slams. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Yeah, it was a little lackluster compared to last year, but as you said, it was still a very good year for them. I think it's nice to see publishers holding back content 
kind of like how you know Todd Howard came on stage at Bethesda a couple years ago and said, "Hey, here's a a nice lengthy look at Fallout 4." And by the way, it's coming yep. out in November, which yep. is like four months from today. You know, I think it's great when you know pubs and devs are able to show their content much closer to when it's coming out because. Sure. I think it leaves less room for miscommunication about what the product is. I mean, I think Watch Dogs is a perfect example of a game that was shown way, way too, too many times yeah, yeah. before it was actually released. And so if they want to hold the content and really make it great and polish and refine it and get the mechanics and stuff set and then show it like a couple months out, yeah. I think I'm okay with that model. 100%. And that would be the hope, right? That we're, by the time we get to, all right, cool, we've seen some of these start coming out. Here, Here's another look at The Last of Us Part Two, and it's in pretty much this year or whatever. And here's the look at what Sucker Punch is doing. It's next year. And like you're right there in this window instead of it. I, I, this, I'm plays into the next question, I think. Over at kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. James Status Chance wrote in and said, do you think that expectations of E3 have gotten unrealistic? Are companies being judged by what fans think should be shown and less on what is shown? I think that was a part of it where Sony's conference was so great, but it was, these are all games we've seen before. These are just updates to the games we've seen. And that's true, but E3 has been megatons. Here's the thing you didn't know about. Now, granted, Shadow of the Colossus, that was a great one. But I think it was... Was it though? Yeah. If they update the controls, and I'm, I'm all in. Right, but I Update think that's controls. that's fan service, right? Sure. Um, for people who have never played that game and maybe don't have an emotional attachment to that game, um, I don't know if that really resonated with them because there's obviously millions of people who don't even know what that game is. Yeah. Um, I agree that you know they didn't have anything new and flashy, but I think sometimes it's, it's a balance between finding the games that they can actually openly talk about. Yeah. And also games that they can tease because it's tough when you tease something, but then you can't, you know, you can't talk about it at all. Anthem, I think, is a great example of that, where we got to finally find out what Bioware is working on. The trailer that they had in the Xbox showcase looked great. They had a teaser, obviously, on stage at EA Play, but we tried to get them to come do you know, gameplay demos or talk sure. to us more about the game. And they're like, oh, we're not really talking about it. Obviously, they talked about it a little bit with a couple other people. Yeah. But I mean, they didn't do widespread coverage uh, for that game. And that was kind of disappointing for me. I was like, well, I was so glad I finally got to see it. But if you're not going to talk about it, then why why are you showing it? Yeah. And that was the thing, too. Like when we did our awards and gave out our stuff, people were like, oh, you didn't give Anthem anything? And I was like, oh, no, like you didn't it, get to get hands it was, on with it. It wasn't technically at E3, and I'm not going to be one of those guys. It was part of E3, you know what I mean? But yeah. yeah, it was like it was a cool demo thing, I guess. But I don't know if that's enough because I that I'm still of the mindset, and I'm not, and I'm not. I I haven't flipped the script, and I hate Bioware. But it was that thing of like, man, these facial animations look really good. And I'm not saying they're going to be terrible facial animations. I'm just I saying know. <laughs> remove the Andromeda thing. I'm just like. I doubt that game is going to ship looking like that. No, yeah. I mean, and I tweeted that while that conference was running. I said, you know, this is the animation Andromeda deserved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But we all know that E3 demos, a lot of the CG that we see on stage is not the graphics that we see in game. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you still believe that every single thing you see on stage is how the game should look, then you're just missing the boat, I think. Yeah, well, I, you have this 4K thing now, so there you go. Everything mm. in 4K. Yeah, Xbox One X and all that stuff. Speaking of, Greg Way, <laughs> Mirex760 said, did the lack of any true exclusives for Xbox One X worry you about the direction of the platform? It seems like Microsoft is moving in the direction of content distribution, not investing heavily in their own content. As a result of this, and an owner of a PC, I see no reason to purchase an X. It feels PC light. What did you think of Xbox One X? Um, I mean, I think, you know, this comment is spot on. I think Xbox One X, it looks great. I think it's too expensive. Sure. Um, I think the price is on par for what you're getting. So here's the distinction. $499 is the right price for the hardware. $499 is not the right price to stay competitive in the overall gaming landscape. Sure. And I think Xbox knows that. Um, what was really disappointing for me, it was, it, was ch it was challenging for me because I had a really nice chat with Phil Spencer and Aaron Greenberg on the Facebook stage. But I also chatted with Jeff Keighley and some others on his show about how that conference did. And I graded it a C plus oh, because okay. I thought it was average and then a little above average. 
because their biggest problem was they said, look at our big fancy hardware. They even went to great lengths to talk about the specifics of the hardware Those on stage, which, flops, Andrea. which they shouldn't have done. Right. Oh. Like, I think that that was, you know, a little gratuitous. I don't but, think they should have teased this thing for a year. No, sir, certainly not, because the expectations got wildly out of control. 100%. I mean, and I, they set that messaging themselves by having all these developers come on in this like weird trailer saying we can't talk to you about Scorpio. But oh, my gosh, it's this is it's moving everything for. light years forward. And they didn't show a game that really demonstrates that. Of course, you know, the, I think the best one on stage was Forza Motorsport 7. And obviously they're going to promote that. But like from a widespread gaming audience, like where was like the tech demo of Halo? Mm. Why could they have not done what Nintendo did with the Wii U and Zelda? Do you remember the Zelda tech yeah, demo? Of course, of course. That was beautiful and it really showcased the technology that the Wii U was capable of. I think Xbox could have maybe won a little bit more if they had done that for Xbox One X to say, hey, something out right now maybe isn't pushing this hardware to the limits, but this is what's coming that you can be excited about and why you should want to buy an Xbox One X. And they kind of didn't do that. I mean, Metro looked beautiful. I thought yep. that that trailer looked fantastic and that game alone would make me want to get an Xbox One X. But Everyone who owns a PC out there that's listening to saying, well, why would I? Yeah. Why would I get that when I have a PC? Well, I mean, there was so many things for like, for me. It was this year of last year showcasing it, doing this. It'll be there next year. Like, holy crap, they have something. Clearly, this won't be the PlayStation 4 Pro. And it pretty much is. And like, I feel like. Oh, it absolutely is. I don't understand why Xbox couldn't have looked at how PlayStation 4 bumbled the message and been like, hey, you know what? We're putting this out. It is more expensive. It is more expensive, but it'll be there when you're there. What you your next TV, everyone, will be a 4K TV. You it'll have HDR. This system will be there when that matters to you. Because right, that's how I feel with the PlayStation 4 Pro. Right? Didn't didn't buy one. Didn't rush out to buy one. But when my next PS4 dies, yeah, I'm gonna buy a PlayStation 4 Pro. Like that's the upgrade strategy. That's how it is for me. Right. And I feel like that message would have resonated more than hey, look at this. And for me, it was the big problem of. Hey, look at Assassin's Creed. Here's Assassin's Creed Origins, the beautiful Vista, all this stuff. And then watching it, I remember going, that, well, that texture doesn't look right. And then jumping in and actually playing it on a 4K monitor right there, I'm like, it's so high def that now the faces in, like, it, it all stands out. Like, they're, like I was playing in, the, in a cutscene, and the guy's face is like, there should be more texture to this. The, his hood should move, not be like plastered to his head like it was. And it's like, this is now making me notice. It looks so good. Right. It's making me, it looks like a game where the textures don't load in right away. And I'm like, that's not what you want to do, but that's what it's going to be for the longest time now as people develop for that base PlayStation 4, that base Xbox One, and then have to just up it for what it's going to be. Right, I mean, this is the exact problem that you know Sony is seeing with kind of splitting the audience of like, now development teams have to, have to ask themselves, who are we going to, you know, kind of optimize our game for? Are we optimizing for these high end people who are spending more money on the hardware? Or are we optimizing for the vast majority of people who are playing on the original models of, of these consoles? And it's going to be interesting to see who is really going to kind of shift to the front or kind of shift to the back of, yeah. of gameplay experiences. Uh, I want to stay on this Assassin's Creed train. Nicholas wrote in kind of funny.com slash KFGD, just like you can. And if it's not working yet, you can get it from my Twitter. Uh, and says, I'm not I'm not a history buff, but I love everything ancient Egypt. Is it okay to be excited about the new Assassin's Creed game if I've never played an Assassin's Creed game for more than an hour? Is the setting enough to condone the purchase of a game? I think you gotta ask yourself what you don't like about Assassin's Creed. This was the whole thing with Colin, where when they said it in the American Revolution, that should have been his game, but he just hates the way Assassin's Creed played, so he couldn't get through it. I mean, you hit the nail on the head there. Like, if you don't like the, the stealth missions, if you don't like the climbing, if you don't like the, you know, the way that the quest system works in that game and that open world exploration, then you're not going to like it more just because it's Egypt, because right. the mechanics are, you know, the vehicle for which you get to see, you know, ancient Egypt. I think it looks beautiful, but I'm a, I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan, yeah, so me too. so I'm excited to to play it. But if you could only get through an hour of the previous ones, you might want to rent it yeah. or borrow it from a friend before I you think make this, the purchase. I mean, I, that's the thing is just not knowing what he, it turned him off. This open world seems more engaging. Like I tried, to, I played, I like Assassin's Creed. Uh, jumped into Syndicate and I liked it enough, but I didn't like the train, like traveling on the train. That yeah. wasn't, I wasn't down for that. So I fell off and played something else at some point and forgot all about it. But. 
the way the map was populating, it felt like the Assassin's Creed. I'm like, oh, right, this is what I'm going to sit here and platinum as I go through and try to get every little piece and do all these different things. And right. the character seemed interesting. And did you do the whole thing where you like go get the statues, then come back and yell at the priest or whatever? Like, I was like, oh, this, this, is, this is Assassin's Creed. This is what I want. Yeah. No, I love I mean, yelling at priests. I, I didn't I didn't play that. Um, but I mean, I don't need to or really want to play yeah. Assassin's Creed ahead of time because I know I'm going to play it. So sure. then I'm just going to have to go back and play those sections over again. But New combat system seems interesting, too. I don't know if, did you do you did the demo a little bit? Did you do it? It's all up on. No, got, I watched the girls do the demo, uh, you got, but you got, I didn't. You get got light attack on. and heavy attack up on R one and R two and stuff. There's no more holding to parry. You actually have to time it and stuff. I'm like, All right. Okay, I'm into it. Yeah, let's see what's up. And then final question comes from Cole Wise. He says, "What the hell is going on with dreams? Should 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 Sony drop this game? Ha ha! Thanks for the ha ha. Uh, that was another one where I was like, are you?" fucking kidding me dreams isn't here they have nothing to show for this one i think it speaks for itself that i don't even remember this game the media molecule one they remember they had the the <laughs> they had this don't you remember this no <laughs> at one of the i think it was a playstation 4 reveal event right they showed the like uh the, here's a little tease from our friends at media molecule and it was like these things dancing and then they've since then shown the game called it dreams like you use the move controllers you pop them up you can paint with it you can do all this different stuff but every time you do it it's always Colin's the whole thing was always what's the game here? What is the game? I don't want to just create stuff and me and Michael's like, there's a game. There's a game. There's a game. Oh, yeah. And then okay. last year they said during the summer there'll be a beta and then summer came and went and here we are n nothing and they weren't even at the showcase. They did put out a tweet saying, hey, we're excited to show you something soon, but who doggies. You know what I mean? I feel like this is going to be. And I mean, with Sony actually closing studios now, I really worry that they're going to put dreams out and then get get out of the media market business. Do you think that they've been maybe converging it for PSVR? I think I think from the get go, it probably was angled for PlayStation VR. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and probably cross play or however you want to describe it, where you could use it, or you don't have to use it. Maybe that's what's happening. But there's no reason to pick up the Move controllers if it's not with the headset, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I you assume I think they've said VR since then. You can let me know over on kindoffunny.com slash forums. I'll check that when we're done with the last segment here uh, to see if I'm wrong about that. But uh, yeah, they've confirmed PlayStation VR before. I don't know what the hell's going on over there, though. It's like, come on. And it's one of those where they left a little big planet. Little Big Planet 3 is done by Sumo Digital. Doesn't do juggernaut numbers. You know what I mean? They go to tear away on Vita, which I'm sure people wanted them to do. Okay, that doesn't perform as you'd probably expect. And then they put it out on PlayStation 4 and another tear away. All right. And then they've just been in this constant process of doing this. And I think it speaks volumes that like Rex goes off and forms his own in studio while still working at Media Malco. Forms another studio to make nights and bikes and stuff. I assume because he actually wants to ship a game. You know what I mean? They actually want to do something and complete it and get it out. It's just like... Oh, God, what is happening over there? Who knows? Andrea. Yes, Greg. We come to the final segment for the day. Other right. than kind of funny, you're wrong. Uh, this is called Squad Up. Squad Up is simple. It's what you know and love as P.S. I love this best friend XOXO. But we've now taken that moniker, put it over on to the morning show where you get to shout out a best friend doing something awesome in the community. Squad Up is where you go to kind of funny .com slash KFGD. You don't have to leave a question. You can also leave your Steam name, your Xbox name, your Switch name, your PSN name, what game you need help with, why you want to play with people, and then we read one of them here, just like I'm doing for the PSN user, Mr. Underscore Piv, P-I-V, 1127. Hey, guys, I got the PlayStation 4 on launch day and played Battlefield 4 with some friends. I can't believe I made it past the server crashes. But now, I mostly play alone, whether it's sports slash shooters, etc. However... Over the last week and a half, as of writing this, I got back into the division. I remember Greg talking about it in the recent patches and updates and gameplay and such, and since I hadn't beaten yet, I decided to give it another shot. After completing the main story, I saw that there are different tiers, allowing you to get more gear and more XP. I made it past the first mission, albeit with some trouble. So I'm reaching out to you and the PSN best friends for some help. I want to clear through these missions and revamp my character and possibly even venture into the dark zone. Thank you in advance, Mr. Underscore P-I-V- one one two seven. That's MR for Mister. Squad up with him, ladies and gentlemen. Go play Division. It's a great game. Great game. A great game. I platinumed it. You still playing Paragon? Uh, yeah, I played last night. I oh, hadn't geez, tried out the new addicted. hero, Mu Kong. I hadn't tried him out yet. How was that? E three. He's very challenging. He's like an expert level play kind of character. But you're an expert at this point, right? I mean, yeah, I have, I mean, I have like 500 hours into that game. Um, but I mean, there are certain characters that you have to spend a lot of time with to learn 
how they play. I mean, anybody who plays MOBAs out there understands that, like, I mean, to get to get expert level with a single character, I mean, you kind of have to spend, like, solid, like, 20, 30 hours minimum with them. Kind of like how good I am with the counselors now on Friday the 13th. Yeah. Expert level <laughs> Friday the 13th player. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Kinda Funny Games Daily for Monday, June 19th, 2017. Thank you so much for stopping by, trying on the show. Remember... It's very simple, and when I say that, it's very complicated. Basically, it's wherever you want it to be. It's going up on YouTube.com slash games. It's up on podcast services now. Please, even if you're not going to use it, go rate us and subscribe to us on iTunes. It really helps us out. Look for it on your other podcast services. Shout them out as they start going up. And remember, you can watch live as we record it each and every day on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. Uh, we don't communicate with you except for when we check in to see what we got wrong. So let's see what, what's happening. This is over on <laughs> kindoffunny.com slash forums under kindoffunnygamesdaily, colon, you're wrong. Um, oh, this is people talking about the system in general. This is this. You can try that, though. Great idea. Here we go. Uh, Coolapix says, Rocket League doesn't need login on another account and will do crossplay between PC, Xbox, and Switch, and also between PS4 and PC. So I guess for Rocket League, doesn't need another account and we'll do crossplay. Yo, so I see what you're saying. Instead, I, I, we were talking about Minecraft, but maybe I screwed that up or whatever. Um, uh, Trevor Starkey, friend of the show, says, read the fast pass discussion. PlayStation had their experience PlayStation app that allowed attendees to sign up for demo appointments. These opened up gameplay or theater demos in two waves throughout the day if you were lucky enough to get there. So somebody, not a correction per se, but blah, blah, blah. So you, you fucked me on that one, Trevor. I read the whole thing and then you said it's not a correction. So there you go. Uh, and then... Yeah, okay. From October 30th, 2015, it is confirmed that Media Molecule is bringing uh, dreams to PlayStation VR. All right. But I don't know if that's what hold, held it up because, again, that's 15. God, sort it the hell out, Media Molecule. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Andrea Renee, the busiest lady in gaming. You can find her on Twitter, of course, over at What's Good Games. I'm always afraid I'm going to screw it up, but Why? I think I nail it every time. I don't know. I just feel like I'm going to, you just see me bumble through our own URL for questions here. And that's why. Well, what, saying say individual letters dog, can know. be tough to do when you're not reading it. Yeah, exactly. Letters yeah. are tough. Letters are so <laughs> hard, you guys. Uh, Andrea will be back with me on Wednesday for another episode of Kind of Funny Games Daily. Tomorrow, it'll be the one and only Tim Geddes. Until then, it's been our pleasure to serve you. Yeah. That's one <laughs> in the bank, Andy. Oh, we revamped all the Patreons. Go there. <laughs>